Okay, we have a good amount of people joining in and as people come in, uh, we'll, we'll see them. Um, so thank you all for joining us here for Backyard Composting with Priscilla Hayes. This is a part of the Watershed Institute's Watershed Wednesday program. And our mission at the Watershed Institute is to keep water clean, safe, and healthy. Uh, we work to protect and restore our water and natural environment in central New Jersey through conservation, advocacy, science, and education. We do this through scientific investigation and monitoring, advocacy and restoration of water and watersheds, extensive environmental education, and modeling best stewardship practices at our watershed center and 950-acre watershed reserve. We'd like to include an environmental justice and land acknowledgement statement. So we recognize that the land and water now under our care is the traditional and ancestral territory of the Lenape Lenape. We pay respect to Lenape peoples past, present, and future and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. We respect their knowledge, culture, and tradition, which have contributed to the conservation of land and water. We also acknowledge that historic white supremacy and environmental racism practices have caused disproportionate environmental and climate impacts on people of color and overburdened communities. The Watershed Institute pledges to work for clean water and a healthy environment, including in communities that have been unjustly affected by systemic racism and environmental pollution. You can learn more about the Watershed Institute's values on our website. Also, if you enjoy the presentation tonight, we have upcoming Watershed Wednesdays. Next month will be about wasps, watersheds, and biomimicry, where a mechanical engineer turned entomologist turned engineer again will talk about wasps and their important role in the watershed, as well as how they use wasp nests to create um, cutting edge sustainable designs. You can register for that event and other watershed events at our um, website and you can check it out on our calendar. So now that that housekeeping is out of the way, I want to introduce our speaker, Priscilla Hayes. Uh, she has been teaching composting since the 1990s when she created educational programs for her clean communities and recycling coordinator educational program with Robbinsville. Her service with the New Jersey Conservation Partnership, as well as falling in love with soil health, deepened her understanding of the crucial role that composting plays in a variety of environmental problems, including dialing down climate change. We're glad to welcome her here today. And if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat or Q&A box and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Also at some point um, in the presentation, Priscilla will ask a, the audience to answer a question. So please put your answer in the chat or Q&A to be um, read during the presentation. So again, we're glad to have her here tonight. And without further ado, I will pass it over to Priscilla. All right, thank you. Um, great, I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, and um, I am, um, I've done a bunch of things, but I am, I have definitely become an organic waste fanatic and also a soil health fanatic, as you'll see in this presentation. Um, ooh, and it's not moving forward. Why is it not doing anything? Uh oh. Um, sometimes you have to click like the right hand side, kind of, then it'll move it forward. There we are. Okay, good. All right. Um, so I um, have been teaching composting since the 1990s when I started teaching it as part of clean communities and recycling. This is me on a cleanup with kids along a roadside um, and not teaching composting at that particular time. I don't have any pictures of me teaching composting. But the rules, um, you know, according to all the books and to the master gardener training that I had taken 
seem very plain and simple. You mix um, green materials and brown materials. You make sure that there's just enough water. You turn it as often as you can to mix it and aerate. Um, you don't add meat or dairy, and then you won't get any rats. And you, the best of all seem to be you get compost for your garden. Um, so, um, but it, it's been a while since then. And what have I learned? Um, well, number one, I've learned that I am an absolute fanatic about making sure that as little organic material from my home goes into the trash as possible. There is still that meat and, um, you know, dairy. Um, but I've learned I'm a lazy composter. And so this is my husband. He's actually turning the compost at the um, garden that we had at St. Gregory the Great, the anti hunger garden we had. But um, he basically likes to turn compost. I don't know why. And um, so as a result, we, we get our compost um, turned. I've also learned that in spite of the fact that they told you no um, rats would come if you didn't put in meat, critters come anyway. I had a bunch of naked rat babies in my compost pile and that was not a pleasant experience. Um, I've learned that weeds are a special case. Um, we'll talk about that as we go on. And I've also learned that the recipe is not as simple as it immediately sounded. It can be tweaked in a million ways, and we'll talk about some of those as we go along. And last but not least, um, and probably somewhat disappointing, um, uh, you probably already know this if you are a composter, but if you're not, it's not going to produce you a garden's worth of compost. So, um, why do you want to compost? Well, compost for Ruli. This is Ruli in our anti-hunger garden, the very first planting event. Um, and we want to make a better world for her and also teach her how to do these kinds of stewardship things. We also uh, want, we compost because trash is one of the places that you have the most ability to take power over your environmental impacts. And organic waste really should not be in the, the landfill any more than you ever have to do it. You also should be doing it for the soil. And don't be Jethro Tull. We'll talk about that too. And um, do it lastly for the planet. Hopefully compost can help save us from our own carbon and climate change uh, to, to at least a certain extent. And so here's our little quiz. Um, Let's imagine that I'm holding up a plastic banana in one hand and a banana peel in the other hand. And um, so if you, are, if you throw them both in your backyard, what is gonna happen to the plastic banana? What's gonna happen to the banana peel? Um, oh, I guess I have two parts to this quiz and I had forgotten that, okay. Um, so, do we have any answers? Yeah, don't be shy. Please put your answers in the chat of what you think um, will happen to the plastic banana or the real banana peel in your backyard. I think we can move on to the next questions. Right. Um, oh, someone said nothing will happen to the plastic banana. Okay. All right. So actually, that's also something that my understanding has changed on over the years. That is not quite true. Plastic, um, okay, the banana peel is going to naturally compost and break into humus in your backyard. The plastic banana, if it sits in your backyard, is actually going to break down. It's just not gonna break down into something good. It's just gonna continue to break down into smaller and smaller pieces. There was a wonderful article that I saved about how Barbie dolls are breaking down and spacesuits are breaking down because they break down into smaller and smaller pieces. It seemed funny, but the thing is, that's why we have a bag ban in New Jersey because Plastic bags break down into smaller and smaller pieces. They're getting into our water and they're getting into our food and we're eating our own plastic bags and presumably plastic Barbie dolls too. Um, okay, so then what if we put both of them in the landfill instead? What's gonna happen to the plastic banana? What's gonna happen to the banana peel? 
especially the banana peel. So Callie says that a banana peel in the landfill will be in an anaerobic state and will emit methane, while the plastic one in the landfill will stay as plastic. Absolutely. Very good answer. She's a plant. Oh, anyway. No. Yes. Yeah, so the banana peel, the plastic banana in the landfill will probably undergo less degradation than in the backyard, but I'm not absolutely sure about that because there are all sorts of nasty um, things in a landfill. But regardless, that'll stay as a plastic banana. The banana peel, uh, one of two things will happen. Either it will be in an anaerobic, it'll be in an anaerobic state one way or the other. But if there are, uh, is enough, enough resources, enough, um, enough resources, not air, since anaerobic doesn't require air, it will emit methane. And um, methane is a gas that is 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide on a 10 year time span. And a 10 year time span is the appropriate one because that's how long that methane remains methane. Um, so it's, it's adding to climate change in a big way if you send your banana peels to the landfill. The other alternative to what's going to happen in the landfill is it'll just get entombed. These are, um, this is William Rath, well, I don't know if it's William Rathje, but it's one of William Rathje's people. Um, he's an archaeologist for the, um, oh gosh, I believe it's University of Arizona, but now I've forgotten which Arizona school. And he's been digging up our landfills for a very long time because they're a wonderful place to do archaeology. He can tell exactly what we were eating and throwing away at any given time. We usually put newspapers in there so that we can tell exactly what date we were throwing away more or less. And these are carrots that are 10 years old. Some of my students thought they could still eat them. Um, anyway, they, uh, so they'll either turn into methane or they will actually be entombed. Um, so not a good place to send um, organic material. All right, so we move on from there into Jethro Tull. If you're, um, a, you know, of a certain age, you will remember Jethro Tull as a band. This is um, one of their album covers. But Jethro Tull, the original Jethro Tull, was um, the first major um, promoter of tilling in the 1700s. And at the time when he promoted it, I guess there had been some um, tilling, of course, by people um, using hand tools or whatever. But at that time, he um, made it more popular. And it seemed to immediately promote better and bigger harvests because what was happening was it was breaking down materials, organic materials, and other things in the soil and feeding the plants a little bit more. But then the end result was that it killed, I mean, it um, first volatilized off much of the organic material, and then, of course, killed many of the living organisms in the soil, which are part of the organic fraction and important to soil health. And oops, sorry, I, I pushed too soon, but um, this is just a little bit about more about tilling. Um, nothing in nature turns soil to this depth. Um, uh, that, you know, plowing or anything else. Um, and it does allow soil organic material to be broken down too much, very fast. Um, before the Industrial Revolution, the major contributors or, uh, to uh, atmospheric carbon releases and to climate change, human-induced um, climate change, were um, agriculture and forestry management. Um, so, all right, so here's a little um, uh, uh, animation. Um, it was taken from my friend, well, my friend um, Ray Archuleta took it from Kilham, whoever that is. But essentially, this is what happens when, um, this is not, this is just a diagram of what happens. But if you till, you start removing some of the important um, organisms and as you continue to till, the whole um, soil health begins to break down. So uh, tilling is not the best thing for the soil. 
So um, to talk a little bit more about this, about soil health basics, um, soil starts as a tree line, according to my favorite soil scientist, Chris Smith, who was with the NRCS, he was not a legislator. Um, healthy soil feeds plants and us without fertilizer and sequesters carbon. And what we humans do to soil daily beats out the organic fraction, which makes the soil not function as well. And that's what's bringing us to compost. But we're gonna talk a little bit more about soil health. Um, healthy soil, can, this is a wonderful diagram that's on the Natural Resources Conservation Service website. Um, and that's in the handout that you got. So you can click on that link. Um, healthy soils, contain more organisms per teaspoon than there are uh, people on the planet. Um, the soils in most of our yards are not at that level of health. Um, and organisms live within and between soil particles. Um, and the rest of this isn't important right now, but if you're interested in soil health, I encourage you to look at the NRCS website. Um, this is a wonderful diagram from another of my favorite books called Understanding Roots. Um, it is a great book to look at just to see a whole bunch of people who clearly didn't have enough to do with their lives and spend a lot of time mapping roots, roots underground. But this shows how the various um, soil organs, organisms are not uniformly distributed, and it depends on a bunch of um, factors, including you can see here that the, uh, the tree roots um, show up much more fungi and then bacteria is further away and we'll talk about some of that kind of distribution too. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been teaching this to kids for a long time and there was, I found this diagram which actually came from the, um, the uh, presentation by the fung uh, whatever the fungus society is for New Jersey, this wonderful um, Australian thing that just shows some of the interaction between the organisms. And it also shows um, that the mycorrhizal fungi, which attach to the tree roots, may be feeding other trees that can't feed themselves, the ones that are under the shade of the tree. So uh, one more. Um, Animation from Ray Archuleta. This just sums up what we're doing. And uh, the tree root can, by itself, can only access a certain amount. And there's much more there. And so if you have this collaboration between the root fungus, which is one of the organisms that requires um, healthy soil and the roots, then you get much more feeding of the tree without any need for fertilizer. All right, so compost, so that brings us back to compost and compost can be one of the things that provide the, um, the organic part of the soil or at least the sort of dead organic part of the soil, including organic carbon, which then provides food for the soil uh, food web and then becomes sequestered in a relatively stable form um, at the same time fighting climate change. All right, so we'll talk about how to compost now. Um, so composting is basically a human adaptation of a natural recipe. We talked about not composting meat or dairy, but when you think about it, of course, um, if you uh, go drive down the side of the road um, and there's a dead deer on the side of the road, it is composting on its own. It's just doing it in an odorous way and that's not something that humans can stand in their backyard. So it's one of the other reasons not to do meat in your backyard. But the, tradi the traditional composting method, which is the one that most of you will be doing in your backyards, blends nitrogen rich materials and carbon rich materials and just the right amount of air and water. So this is a picture of some of some um, vegetable peels and some tomatoes that didn't quite make it, eggshell in my little um, sink side bin and then some, uh, and that 
that provides the green, the nitrogen rich things. And although not everything is green in that category. And then you have things like leaves, which are brown, but there's other things like paper, things that are carbon rich. Um, and I talked about how turning and tilling is not necessarily a good idea for the soil, but it is traditionally used during the composting process to both provide oxygen and help keep the organisms heating up or cooling it down as the process requires. There are, however, um, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit, compost geeks in a way who who talk about trying to provide aeration without turning because um, it may uh, improve your um, the uh, some other organisms that you want to encourage. All right, so um, there's a number of sort of um, you know measures of how much nitrogen to carbon. Um, my favorite composting book, which is in your um, handout. The Organic Book of Compost by Pauline Pears um, says equal weights of carbon rich and nitrogen rich. I don't know how you really totally measure that. Um, the Monmouth County Master Gardeners say two parts um, nitrogen uh, carbon to one of nitrogen, but you're going to have to experiment with your own particular blend of available organic waste. And the thing is, that you're also going to have to. Um, tailor it to whatever it is, are your, your habits, your composting habits, if you're lazy or if you're not so late, you know, if you turn all the time. And um, you can also play with the balance of materials to, that make changes then on their own to the ecology of the pile and make it more bacterial or more fungal. And that's what I was talking about with the Compost Geek extension. And I should just explain that. I was at Rutgers. I had been teaching um, composting for years. My colleague, um, Joe Heckman, invited a woman named Elaine Ingham in to talk about compost. And I went just because I would go to, well, any of my friends' presentations, but also anything about compost. And it was like, an entirely new world because it was, you know, you do this to get make it more bacterial, you do this to make it more fungal. It was just, um, the, you know, there's just so much more to learn. All right, so this is not necessarily um, anything that you have to, to um, memorize or anything, but you, you need sort of a critical mass of material. Um, it doesn't really heat up well until you have a certain amount. I'll show you a picture from Newark where they didn't have quite that much. And if you turn it, it'll heat up to a certain range, which helps to kill off weed seeds and break things down pretty quickly. And it, um, the turning will encourage certain organisms and then at a certain point, they will sort of die off and, you know, the next, rain, the next group of organisms will take over. So um, turning then at that point, it, it helps heat it and it, later then it will aerate it and help it cool. Um, you want mo moisture to feel like um, a wrung out sponge and, um, you, um, you want to, at a certain point, stop feeding, which I mean, by that I mean adding new material, and allow it to cool and cure to something that's usable. If you use it too soon, you do run, run the risk of it still being in the composting stage, and it'll sort of um, take material, it'll It'll be looking for things from your plants, perhaps, and, and not be as beneficial to the plants that you're trying to feed or um, give organic material to as if you wait. Um, all right, so here's some recommended nitrogen-rich green materials, banana peels, citrus fruits, all of these things. Um, even hair, I guess our hair is high in nitrogen. Um, Barbara Bromley, who taught me um, in the Master Gardener program, 
swore by bunny poop. She had a lot of bunnies. Um, so manure from vegetable eating animals, um, tea bags, and um, you can add, oh, I forgot. Oh, I do have grass clippings on here. Grass clippings um, and you know some um, trimmings from um, plants, but you, um, we're gonna talk about weeds as a special case. Um, carbon rich um, materials are leaves, paper, sawdust, shredded cardboard, wood chips, <coughs> hay and straw, and um, some woody plant and weed stems. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, carbon sources, a few more slides about carbon sources. Typically you're gonna get your most, um, well, you'll get, you'll get the greens, the, uh, the nitrogen rich things all year round because presumably you're eating vegetables and you have vegetable peels all year round and all in eggshells and all of those things but the leaves are falling in the fall. So if you want to have leaves all year round, you can save them in what I've been calling a leaf corral and add them as needed. Now, um, and I'll talk about it again later, but if you are someone who um, follows Doug Tallamy, you know that leaves actually harbor a number of organisms that we're trying to um, to promote. So you're going to have to figure out your own balance of using leaves as a carbon source and letting leaves lie so that the organisms that are overwintering can use them. <clears throat> um, some other special carbon issues. Uh, so I talked about wood chips or anything like that. Um, size reduction is key with woody material. And um, even when you, that means making it smaller. Um, you have more, um, piece, uh, more edges for the organisms to work on and, and chew away at. Um, but regardless of how small you make it, um, it's harder to break down than the greens. And so you may have to just keep screening it out and sending it back through the cycle a few times. Um, so, and then there uh, is the issue of napkins and paper towels. Um, essentially, we have um, we. I, I'm trying to use fewer and fewer paper napkins and towels all the time, but um, we have over the years put them in without worrying about size reduction. My husband turns it regularly, and this does seem to keep the um, paper breaking down. Um, it does break down faster than, um, than wood chips, but, um, uh, you know, uh, carbon sources do require special treatment. Um, here's, my friend has a leaf shredder like this and has been using it successfully for years. Um, and, you know, I'm assuming that you can probably size reduce, get some sort of shredder to size reduce other. Um, woody materials. Um, there are, um, you know, materials online for this. Again, there's, it's always a balance because um, one of the first things that I did at, when I was teaching at Little Brook School, uh, garden at Little Brook School, was have the kids do a project on the, um, the organisms overwintering on the, the oak leaves there. And I really sort of started not wanting to do so much leaf shredding. Um, sorry, um, I went too fast, but uh, anyway. All right, so um, now we're on to um, what's not recommended for your compost pile. And I'm clearly using somebody else's um, slide and I didn't realize that it had a, an animation. Um, these are not recommended for your compost pile. Dairy products, we already talked about that. Um, Number one, it has fats and things that make it not break down so quickly. And number two, it may attract rats and, and mice um, trying to eat things. Um, disease plants, um, dryer lint. Dryer lint should never, never um, go into your compost pile because dryer lint on the whole is largely 
um, the, like those broken down Barbie dolls that we talked about earlier, it's smaller and smaller pieces of plastic and you're just letting uh, plastic, all the thing, all the polyethylene that your clothes are made out of, um, your fleeces and many other clothes, um, you're letting that out into the environment and um, that's not what we want to do. Meat and bones, again, um, unless you have a special compost um, uh, equipment that can handle that, don't put it in. Um, pet waste from meat eaters like dogs and cats. Interestingly, there are some, um, some compost uh, equipment that can handle that, but on the whole, that's not a good thing. And weeds gone to seed. Um, and then um, things like mugwort, um, which is my vote for most well-adjusted organism on the planet, uh, things like that, where if you put in the little pieces of the plant, it, you'll just end up with 10,000 new plants. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that brings us right to pernicious weeds. Okay, so there are two different issues um, with pernicious weeds, which the previous slide sort of hinted at. So here's... Um, a small mugwort jungle in, at my old house. Um, we had a wonderful big one at uh, my Rutgers stewardship garden, but mugwort um, spreads by rhizomes underground. Um, and it just, uh, the, the um, Jean, Jean Marie Hartman of landscape architecture used to yeah, tell us that when we were weeding each time, the mugwort was just laughing at us because each little shard was going to grow into, you know, new mugwort pieces. So we were just proliferating it. Um, and then on the other side, we have bittercress, which um, you'll see there's some flowers on it and then there's some seed pods on it. And when those seed pods get totally ripe and hard, you will, if you touch them, they will just shoot seeds all over. So both of these um, kinds of weeds provide, um, produce problems in your compost piles for different reasons. Um, the bittercress weed seeds are not broken down or not killed if you aren't, if you are a lazy composter like me. Um, the mugwort, I don't think anything would kill that, but um, there is a possibility of creating a hot compost, which means lots of turning, lots of greens and browns. Um, uh, the um, Elaine Income, who talks about the um, the fungal and the bacterial blend claims that a fungal, that creating a fun, more fungal compost will also allow ammonia to, um, to be created and that'll break down some of the weed seeds. But um, I have over the years created sort of a back 40 notion um, where I pick a part of my yard to essentially, um, put all of that material and just let it sit and hopefully sort of in a way smother it with, um, you know, with material constantly going on top. But if you look at the Pauline Pears book, she has some other suggestions for putting things into black bags and turning it into sludge for an, a period of time. And all of that is labor intensive, but um, again, try and do as little organic material in your garbage as possible. Um, all right, and then another interesting problem is the notion of compostable packaging, um, especially organic products, and you can see I bought some organic sweet peppers here, um, come with compostable packaging. And we already talked about landfills. If you're sending compostable packaging to landfills, you might as well it might, I mean, it, it doesn't matter that it's compostable because nothing's gonna happen to it in the landfill. But um, compostable is actually uh, something that in the United States is generally shown by um, a symbol that shows that it complies with standards set by the US um, Composting Council. Sorry, I 
have the name here wrong. Um, and I suspect this group did not want to pay whatever fee it was to get theirs um, certified as compostable. But regardless, one way or the other, even things that are certified by the US Composting Council are not readily compostable in the backyard. They're compostable in large industrial facilities. If you were going to compost this tray in the backyard, you'd really have to cut it into small pieces to make it work in any um, reasonable amount of time. <clears throat> um, if you are in Lawrenceville or some other place where there is a municipal composting program, I encourage you to use it regardless of whether you do home composting because that allows you to send out meat and all sorts of things that you can't do in your home composting program. All right, so um, then now we've got the recipe. Um, we've talked a little bit about some of the things that go in. Um, and we'll go back to aeration. Um, so um, I, uh, turning the pile means the difference between having finished compost in a few weeks or in a longer period of time. If you're a lazy compost, you're gonna have finished compost, you're just gonna be waiting longer. If you continue to turn the pile, um, you're gonna not get critters that are looking to, for a warm place in the winter. That was what happened with me and the rats. The rat mom built a little house in my compost pile because I hadn't turned it for a while. And all of a sudden there were a bunch of naked rat babies, which she never came back for and presumably ended up as compost. Um, <clears throat> the other thing you need to do is plan for success. So have a countertop container um, right next to your, um, your sink where you can put the prep waste. Otherwise, you're going to forget. Uh, so you need something right by your sink. Um, plan the location of your composter so it's close to your back door. Um, you might want to have something for the winter that goes indoors. Um, <coughs> have a, a hose nearby in case it gets too dry. Um, during the winter, uh, in spite of what I said about the rats, um, it was probably earlier um, that I didn't turn or I didn't turn for a very long time. But during the winter, mostly you're not going to turn. Um, you're just going to add material. Um, you can turn as long as things aren't frozen um, and then stop for a while. Um, here's one of the wonderful uh, women who um, started, who um, participated in our pilot in Newark with home composters. Uh, she loved her composter and she was feeding it all the time. But, you know, she didn't have a lot of um, peels and all of that to feed it. And she probably didn't have any leaves at all. So um, she suffered from a lack of volume and she wasn't going to be getting a lot of compost, but she still was really invested in the idea of composting. So this is the inside of her composter and it's hard to see, but there are little grubs in there and it's pretty wet. So um, she was a little concerned about that. Um, you can see there's a lot of corn too, which takes a while to break down. I mean, essentially she just needed to um, add additional carbon to take out some of the moisture. Um, the, the, um, the grubs or the larvae weren't gonna hurt her compost. They just make it a little unsightly. Um, so here's some troubleshooting for the traditional recipe. If it's too west, wet, um, too moist, turn and add carbon. If it's too dry, add water. Um, if it smells, turn it and add carbon. If you have poachers, like little creatures that come and steal things, um, I don't care. I mean, I, I've gotten to the point where I share and share alike. Um, and if you um, are making it too warm and you're encouraging things to have, make little homes in there, turn the compost. Um, uh, the idea of finished compost is really sort of a misnomer. Um, we were doing um, some testing during that Newark trial in, at the Woods End Laboratories. 
Um, come, uh, Organic material, uh, by definition, is always in flux, but um, if you get it to the point where it's cool and it's not um, heating up anymore, it should be finished enough to apply to your um, gardens. Um, so you, um, the traditional ways of using compost are tilling it into the soil, but we already talked about not tilling, doing, not doing so much. Um, Compost tea is still a good option. Making potting soil out of it is definitely a good option because we need to start using less um, peat moss and, um, denude, and not denuding the um, Canadian peat bogs so much. And one of the really good ways of using compost is as a mulch or top dressing because that's the way of sort of getting it onto the soil the way that nature does. Um, so um, post tilling, it's sort of some of the same things. Um, so garden renovation and re rehabilitating an area. So that may be one of the times when you want to do some tilling, at least in the beginning, so that you um, mix some of the um, organic material in. But um, top dressing and mulching are um, one of the best, and minimum tillage are, are on the whole the best if you can handle that. Um, let's see, uh, I didn't edit this slide enough because I have a thing about my Pro and it's not my new friend anymore. But um, the main thing to get out of this slide is that if you, um, you want to have an area where you're feeding and turning actively, and then you want to be able to walk away from that area and let it cure and move on to another area. Um, you want a nice um, hardware cloth and frame screen, some sort of way of screening out the bigger pieces. Um, which often includes those woody things that you wanna add back in again. Um, and I love this special recipe, two particular acres, which is a big composting site over in Pennsylvania, did a thing where they put, took traditional mulch, ground, um, you know, wood chips and compost and they, add, they top dressed um, landscaping beds with it. And the beauty of it is that the compost um, adds a, um, a nice um, bit of organic material that's gonna get into your soils faster and also feed them. And the mulch, of course, over time will break down um, and feed things too. Um, but it's a nice specialty product and you can make it in your own yard. Um, so compost tea, um, we did some research while I was at Rutgers with the Rutgers Blueberry Cranberry Center. And uh, essentially we did um, some research with worm composting tea where we um, applied the tea to leaves and it seemed to outcompete the fungus and keep some of the fungus away from blueberries and well, I think we were doing it just on blueberries. I don't think we were doing it on cranberries, um, which have uh, you know, a well-known fungus problem. So um, there's a whole bunch of recipes. Um, if you are interested in compost tea, um, there's a whole bunch of ways of making it, um, just soaking it like a giant tea bag, or there's aerated um, equipment that you can buy. Um, there's all sorts of ways of doing that. And that's something that, Elaine Ingham was pushing and still is pushing um, very much. So, um, and here's some, um, I'm not gonna do sheet composting, but here's some, um, part, some compost um, systems. <coughs> These are things that you can buy for your backyard. Um, the earth machine, lots of counties um, sell them or give them away in large amounts. Um, the new, we had them, that was it, what we used in the Newark pilot. Um, the one in the middle is a really nice one, Green Johanna, which is bigger, you can't tell here, but it's bigger than the Earth Machine, but it's essentially the same model. Um, 
It's supposed to be critter proof, um, it's supposed to even be bear proof, and it's supposed to accept meats um, because it's critter proof. But um, that's, again, something that you need to experiment on, on your own. The other one I don't have, I haven't actually tried. I've tried the other two, but I haven't tried the green culture compost bin. But that one I liked because it has a bunch of access doors and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, compost tumblers are a great idea. Um, there's all sorts of, oh, the one up on the left we had um, at one of my schools, and it was wonderful because it was a giant ball and the kids loved, we would roll it up the hill and then they would roll it down again. It was great to work with kids um, and teach with kids because it was fun. Um, and that one probably works year round to to because you can just push it around. But what I found with tumblers is that during the winter, um, if you're trying to turn it at all, um, and you probably do want to turn it with a tumbler in the winter, but uh, it it freezes. So the the um, the food waste, which is largely water, will freeze to the bottom, and it makes it very hard to turn in the winter. Um, the other thing that I found was uh, that um, my former yoga studio had one in the back and they loved it, except that what they had was they were buying compostable plates, um, which basically just sat there because, you know, paper just doesn't break down that fast. There was hardly any nitrogen rich material. So you can't overwhelm um, any home composter and especially a, um, a tumbler with quote unquote compostable paper. Um, this, this, is, this I saw at a flower show, one of the flower shows. It's wonderful because there was a woman in Michigan who just, you know, she'll just pick it up and she like swings it around and that, that um, turns everything inside. It's, um, it's permeable. Um, in the winter, you can bring it into your garage and put it in a trash can that has a few holes up higher um, so that you get some air in there, but then the, um, it's not going to seep all over your, um, your garage. Um, that same woman who like was swinging it around at all the time, she would put it in the summer into her garden and essentially it seeped compost tea into her plants right away and bed baths and beyond. It used to be called the compost comfort bag, or at least the one I saw was, but now bed bath and beyond has something. Um, you could get it on your wedding um, registry. Oh, the woman in, in Michigan also during the winter, I think she used it on a balcony. So um, this one was not very satisfactory. I did a, a trial of a whole bunch of composters for TerraCycle and this one didn't work well. Um, oh, Olivia, Priscilla, maybe... I just wanted to give you a 10 minute. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, good. So um, then um, these are you build ones. The left one, the one on the left is the one my husband built for me. Um, it initially had three chambers um, um, and he designed it. Um, I won't say anything one way or the other that about that, but we ended up taking out the middle parts and we ended up being lazy composters. The other ones were, were our tumblers that um, I think um, the one at the at the bottom right was being used at one of the schools I did a waste audit at. So it was very cute, but they weren't actually using it. Um, leaf corrals, um, uh, the, the one that you're seeing two pictures of on the right is just a group of pallets put together. Um, there on the left um, were, uh, you can buy sort of very flimsy-ish fold out composters and they're, they're much better for as leaf corrals than as actual composters. Although the beauty of them is they can be moved around pretty easily and you could actually sort of move them around and be, have something curing in one spot. So. Uh, you could probably use, just get more than one and use one as a leaf corral and one as a composter if you want. Um, this is the green cone. It's not a composter, it's a digester. It digests things anaerobically, which, and you dig it into the ground. You don't get a product out of it, and you, but you have to clean it out every few years. But essentially, it's 
it digests down dog poop, or I guess a limited amount of dog poop. I'm, I can't, um, and meats and fats. Um, and it allows you to, uh, in um, Vermont, they were using these in tandem with the green Johannes so that um, homes could get rid of pretty much all their organic waste. <clears throat> Um, here's verma, a fancy vermicomposter. I've done verma com, a worm composting in all sorts of things, much less fancy than this. Essentially, my feeling about worms is they're fabulous if you're at a school and you're teaching children, but otherwise don't expect a whole lot out of it. It's, it's labor intensive. I mean, they're cool. They're very cool um, to learn about their life cycle, but it's not you know, and you probably get the best um, compost tea, but it always killed me to think that I was killing some of my worms as I was harvesting the compost. So anyway, um, Bokashi is also a, um, an anaerobic system, but it's a fermentation system. We tried that at one of my schools. Um, and a lot of people swear by it. There's a garden in New York City that uses it and then composts the result with worms. And they have turned their, um, their garden around from like what was essentially a, uh, you know, a impervious, well, you know, um, a, a very compacted soil site to a very productive garden. Um, and then this is the next to the last, or yeah, the next to the last slide. It, it's very busy and you have a copy of it and you're not necessarily going to I don't want you to get anything more out of it than that there, you know, you have the option of choosing what kind of thing you're going to do based on what kinds of things you want to compost and what kinds of products that you want. But um, this is um, from the book that I love with the Pauline Pears book, which I hope everybody goes out and gets or buys. Um, because it just, it's really a one stop. It's the most succinct um, compost book of any that I've ever seen. Um, and um, then you have these links too. Um, here's Elaine Income, and she's promoting the Soil Food Web. And there is a YouTube um, uh, video here of her talking. Um, it seems to cut in in the middle of the talk, but you can get some of the notion of the sort of really geeky um, things that she's into, um, the fungal versus bacterial, um, and um, promoting uh, relationships between the plants and the soil. Um, so yeah, there's that. And then I think that's it, contact information. And yeah, if anybody has questions, um, I will answer them. <laughs> Thank you so much, Priscilla. That was a great presentation. I feel like you went through a lot, but uh, it was all really good information um, that will get maybe some of the future soil nerds started. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the questions that were in the chat, uh, going back to one of the slides uh, where you were talking, beginning talking about soil health, you had a statement that said, soil starts at the tree line. And um, someone asked if you could clarify what that meant. Well, I, I have to say, I've never totally understood um, what uh, Chris is saying about that, but um, essentially it just, it talks in part about the fact. Um, all right, so what happens is trees are the best example of this. When trees photosynthesize, they, um, they use the sun to create sugars and they feed themselves with the sugars, um, but then they produce excess sugars and they move those sugars down to the soil and feed the fungus. So essentially what he is saying is that the, the um, you really, that you should be considering the trees as part of the soil. I mean, they come from the soil they interrelate with the soil, the relationships are there. Um, and I mean, that's sort of what I think that he's saying. The other thing is he has papers about the trees. 
I think he was part of the movement. There's a current movement in the NRCS, um, and it's reflected in that book that's on the list the, called The Soil Will Save Us, to use the soil to sequester much more carbon. And the trees do that too. So between the trees and the um, soil, you can sequester, you can take out enormous amounts of carbon and sequester it. Um, so you can't obviously, well, it, I don't know, it's not obvious to all soil scientists, but you can't take out all of it. But the point is, is that it's much better to con consider it all as part of the same ecosystem um, than to consider it separately. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, another question was, I have a compost pile, um, some of which is turned into soil. How do I know that it's ready to be added to my plants? Um, it's mostly by um, temperature. If it's um, cool to the touch, then it should be ready. Um, if your texture, you know, if most of the, um, the, the greens, at least the nitrogen rich things have, you know, disappeared in the sense that you can't tell what they are anymore and it's cool to the touch, then you can use it in your garden. Um, you should still probably screen it before you do that and just take out um, any larger chunks of things. Um, and then you can re-add a lot of that back into your new compost pile. Thank you. Um, another question that just came in is, is there a certain way to start a new compost uh, pile? I just started a spinning bin with lots of food waste and shredded paper. Is there anything else I should add to get it started? No, that's it, basically. Um, you know, the organisms are out there, so um, that those two things will do it. As long as you have sufficient um, moisture, it should feel like a wrung out sponge, not be wetter than that. And, um, you know, you give it some air. Um, and that, oh, and that, yeah, that's a point. So one of the reasons to um, aerate it, whether you do it statically somehow, like Elaine Ingham is recommending, or by turning, is because otherwise things do go anaerobic and you end up with methane rather than um, compost. Um, you end up with a different process. So yes, you want to make sure that you continue to aerate it and not let it go anaerobic. If anybody has ever put grass clippings in a black bag and put them out at the curb, I don't think that's even allowed anymore, you'll know how quickly things break down and go anaerobic. So um, yeah, those are, those are the recipe elements. You've got them there. Um, that's, good. that's a good segue into the next question. Uh, where someone asked uh, in greens versus browns and composting, if I'm mostly just going to be composting leaves and yard waste and not really adding many greens, is this composting or is it something else? It's definitely composting. And that brings us to things like municipal composting. Um, by law in New Jersey, um, which is not necessarily based in science, um, municipal composting facilities have to compost their leaves separately from um, other things. So um, leaves will compost and turn into a material, um, a compost regardless. So don't think that you're not getting compost. Um, just uh, Uta Krogman at Rutgers did a study, though, of municipal compost facilities of their product, and they're very heavily uh, carbon-based. That doesn't make them a bad material. It just makes them a different material, one that's usable for different kinds of things. But again, it's going to add carbon to your soil or sequester. So... I mean, essentially, my answer to that is things are going to compost regardless. Um, you know, there, and that's another reason why that initial recipe, you know, carbons and nitrogens, 
I mean, it's something that you can tweak and play with in your own yard and with your own materials. Great, again, going into another question that someone just asked, um, why don't large scale municipal composting programs always work? Uh, they heard Princeton tried for a while and then had to stop. Are they the best approach or is it better for every property owner to compost on their own? Well, I have strong opinions about this question. Um, municipal compost um, programs generally do not work because people do not understand what they're doing. Um, they put in the wrong materials. Um, I remember doing a waste audit somewhere once and we were doing it for a comp and uh, you know we were trying to separate food waste for the day and find out how much they had and somebody put in some plastic from around it and I'm like that's not food waste and they're like it, they it, it never reached their mind that it was not food waste you know it was like waste from around food somehow and I'm like how does this make any sense but but people are you know lazy and yeah I mean I'm sorry that's just what happens and and it is the compost well there I mean my other presentations I have a minions theory that people think that there's somebody who's going to pick this stuff out after the you know um in fact there were comp there were organic waste programs in New Jersey that did just that, picked everything up, but it's like, it's not sustainable. It's like, can you imagine being the poor schmuck who has to go down in there and pick out, you know, ketchup packets and things like that? It, it's, it's crazy. Um, the Institute for um, Local Self-Reliance did a wonderful um, little article about uh, local programs so um, their feeling was that not necessarily everybody had to do it in their backyard, although I think that's a really good start, but that there should be local programs where it's much more controllable. Um, Princeton University has a composter that was designed by my friend Nick Smith Sebasto. And, you know, again, you have to worry about what goes in it, but it's, they're doing it on their own on their own as a local kind of thing. I think Lawrenceville School may have one too. Um, I don't remember. Oh no, they were talking to me about, yeah, they were having some issues with that. But um, yeah, it, it's very likely that something that you can keep better control over is gonna work better um, because people do throw in the wrong things. Um, that's true of every program. They throw the wrong things in the trash, the wrong things in recycling, and the wrong things in compost. Thank you. That was um, really interesting and a lot to think about. So a couple of quick questions, um, well, quick answers, I think, are should I avoid adding pits and seeds from fruits to my pile? Um, I did have a friend who, like, uh, brought us avocado trees to school that had all, um, you know, germinated in his compost pile. But, you know, um, I, I don't, you know, I've never, um, I've never found it a problem. Um, they're not going to break down fast. They'll probably be one of the things you screen out and put in over and over, but it's, I don't think it's a major problem. No. Okay. And then also when composting paper, uh, should you be concerned about the ink leaching into the compost, to the soil, to the food? That's a really good question. Um, the, uh, on the whole, um, if you're composting office paper, you're probably not going to have a problem with the inks that are on it. Newsprint is a special case because the inks have changed over the years. It used to be that the black and white, that you should put in nothing but black and white paper because the inks were non-toxic. But then I did a research project where I called the Star Ledger and it seemed like the colored ones all of a sudden were the ones that were non-toxic and the black and whites had toxic stuff. So if you're willing to do the, you know, to call the newspaper and find out, but I don't think they even know exactly. They really don't know what's in their inks. So, um, 
you know, I, I think you can probably, uh, I, I think you, you just can't worry at a certain point. You really can't, you know, it's more size reduced it and just not worry about it because, you know, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer to that one is because I've, I've, I've investigated a bunch of times over the years and it's just not, there's no easy answer to that because it's also a moving target. The inks are different all the time. Um, another question that came in was, what about putting fireplace ashes in your compost? Is that okay? Um, I suspect so. Uh, you know, I just haven't done that. My husband applies them to the lawn, so they must be probably they're fine. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Um, I, I don't think that should be a problem. Um, you know, the, yeah. Um, and then another question that might take a little longer is, could you go over the tips again about composting in the winter? Um, this person has an outdoor tumbler and noticed that things didn't really break down well in the winter. Um, the, the very first tumbler I saw, it was in the winter and, um, uh, you know, food waste is largely water. Um, you know, all vegetables and fruits are largely water. And so in the winter, they begin to, um, to, freeze uh you know i mean it would your best bet might be to bring it into your garage if it's of a size that you can do that so it doesn't freeze during the winter and turning it in there you know putting in some place where you can actually keep it from freezing um although maybe your garage is really cold too but yeah the, uh, um the, the thing is, uh, you know, presumably if you're adding enough carbon material along with nitrogen material, you wouldn't necessarily need to, to turn it at all in the winter. But, you know, if you want to turn your tumbler in the winter, I think you're going to have to find a way to keep it from freezing. Okay, uh, great. So uh, we don't have any more um, questions coming in directly related to composting, but one person did ask um, when you talked about the kind of the forest soil composition was fungal versus bacterial um, ecosystems. Could you elaborate on that? Well, and I'm, I was trying to remember for this which book I read it in. It was the most amazing book um, about forests and Essentially, um, the, the, the mix changes as you go from vegetables, which are more bacterial, to forests. So an old growth forest has miles, millions of miles. I mean, I think it is literally millions of miles of fungal bodies underground, okay? And everyone should know that the things that pop up as mushrooms are not the fungal body, they're the fruiting body. And the fungus lives underground in all these miles of, of micro, of, of um, what are they called? The, the tiny little filaments underground, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And um, I just adore the fact that it's, I mean, and what they do is they, um, they feed the, the trees and they connect from tree to tree and they, um, and so a tree that's old will often, as it's dying, transfer a lot of its nutrients through the fungus to other younger trees. Uh, younger trees that are under, under shade get um, transferred food through those networks. But the, the more you have an undisturbed place, the more you have those fungal networks. And this book talked about the, and I don't remember, it probably on one of those on the list, but it might not be, it might be something like the trees in my forest, or there's a bunch of forest books that came out fairly recently. Um, it's just that, you know, the soil, vegetables like a more bacterial soil, and so you never get the fungus buildup there usually, but 
you know, as I said, as you go more and more to undisturbed old growth forests, and in old growth forests, there just aren't any in New Jersey anymore. There's a tiny little one that Rutgers has and, and things that are close to it, but it takes a long time for that fungal network to build up. I hope I've answered this question um, well enough, but um, it's just amazing. I mean, the body of fungus that's underground um, and that only exists, you know, or that more exists as you don't disturb forests. Oh, I'm sorry, I know what the other thing was I was going to talk about. Chris Smith, the wonderful NRCS um, soil scientist did a project in Ocean County because they had soil compaction there, really bad soil compaction. And he showed us, he took water out to the little forest, the undisturbed forest, and he would just do a rain simulation and the water seeps in immediately. It doesn't stay on the soil. Whereas in the lawns that were in Ocean County, it just ran off. It ran off onto the sidewalk because that, you know, the things that we do, it's not just tilling, it's mowing your lawn, it's walking on your lawn, it's all sorts of things that compact the soil immediately and you know, make it hard for the organisms to remain and make it hard for water to get in there. They need the air and the water spaces in there, so. Great, I think that did answer the question they were asking about. And that's definitely something that I didn't know before, uh, the difference between more bacterial or fungal soil. Um, and someone in the chat did um, ask, uh, was the tree, the book you were thinking of called The Hidden Life of Trees? Oh, that, that was the one. Yes, I think it was because um, there were chapters on each part of the, so um, if that's the one I'm thinking of, there were chapters on each sort of layer of the forest um, uh, because there's various different layers too. Um, and also just, as I said, on old growth versus, you know, less so. Great, um, glad we got that, that answer for the name of that book. And then a final great question I think that we can end on is, is aerating the same thing as tilling? Like, is it bad? Um, my landscaper does this and then spreads corn gluten over the lawn. Oh, well that's core aeration. So what that does is just pull out little cores and essentially the, the theory is you let some air in to the root in those little holes. Um, you know, we used to do that. I'm not sure whether that's really um, helpful or not. I mean, it probably is. Uh, it's just that as you core aerate, you're like compacting the soil at the same time because you're running some equipment over it to do it. The corn gluten is um, to a pre-emergent uh, substitute and that's a really good thing. Um, that's probably from Gardens Alive or I don't know, something like that. I, my husband refuses to use it, but um, I know it's a good thing to um, suppress you know, the weed seed or the, not weed, but the annual grass germination. So that's a good thing. Yeah, the core aeration is a different kind of thing. Um, you know, it's hard to know. You have to do a little more research on that for yourself, but they're running heavy equipment over it to do it. So you're sort of compacting and aerating at the same time. I don't know, you have to figure it out, I guess, whether it's helpful in the end. Great. Well, thank you so much for answering all the questions that came in and for your presentation. Um, we're just at our end of our time. So if anyone has any more questions, you can see uh, Priscilla's contact information here. You can also reach out to um, me uh, the, or you can reach out to the Watershed Institute with any questions as well. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a great night.